Hello, hello, everyone. This is your host, Youssef, for Big Juice Podcast. I'm so excited today to announce that this is the first episode that's going to be held in English language. Not just that, it's also going to be the first interview-themed episode. So this means that I have a guest today that is going to go through the topic of the episode, which is the Arabic language. Good morning, Sharik Filani. Good morning, Youssef. It's not Filani, it's Filian. 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 Like, uh, if you want to sound French in Lebanon, they say filian, but if you want to pronounce it the Armenian way, it's filian. So, where are you originally from? I'm Lebanese, but I have Armenian roots. Oh, okay. That's like, my, my great-grandparents are of Armenian origin. Okay, that's a good start. So, <laughs> let's say happy Easter <laughs> and happy quarantine. I'll let you guys... Uh, Thank you. Find- happy Easter. Happy Easter to you, likewise. Just let you guys uh, know that me and Charig are keeping the rules of social distancing. So we're making this episode through an application. We're not face to face. And how are you lying? Pointing. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're, we're social distancing, of course. So how are you coping up with the quarantine and the lockdown? In London. Well, I don't know. It depends. Sometimes I feel good. Sometimes I feel low, like everyone else. Yeah. So as you know from the title of the episode that today we're going to talk about the Arabic language, which is so ironic because this is the first English episode where we're going to talk about the Arabic language. But can you, Sharik, introduce yourself to our listeners today and what do you do and why you're here today? And especially what does it mean by Sharik? Well, yeah, as, as you said, I'm Shari. My family name is Filian. 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 Um, my name means, <laughs> my name means little particles of dew. It's even more complicated than my name. But anyways, yeah, yeah. Let's go so ahead I'm from Lebanon. I'm from Lebanon. Uh, I live in London. I've been here for almost nine years. I work as an Arabic language teacher. I've worked with diplomats in the foreign office in London, and also uh, I taught in the Ministry of Defense Wow! at the University, University of Westminster, different places. So I teach across different companies in London, in different companies That's across cool. you London. You have a good, a good resume. So Thank why you. did you choose the Arabic language? Because I know that you can speak Armenian, English, a little bit of French, and Arabic, but why did you pick Arabic? Uh, there's no like a uh, flowery reason. It's just because when I used to live in, uh, when I used to live in Lebanon, I used to be an English language teacher. But when I came to the UK, I realized that nobody needs my English because obviously people speak much better English than me. So I thought, why can't I? take this as an opportunity to explore my own language on a, on a more professional level. So I started doing this. But I do have a degree in translation. I have a master's degree in translation and intercultural communication. And my, my PhD was in language discourse and communication. So I do have like wow. a ling- linguistic background anyways. That's good. And what, what makes you feel that the Arabic language is unique or... Of many things, but the first thing that comes to my mind is that it's such a flowery language. It's very poetic and uh, we have so many beautiful expressions that don't exist in other languages. Sometimes when I come to say something we say in Arabic, I want to say it, explain it to someone here in London. I just find myself with no words to say the same thing because we don't have the same we have a different culture basically and the language reflects the the culture that we have okay what is the root of the arabic language the arabic language comes from what we call a semitic language it's a semitic language just like hebrew aramaic Um, so these languages of course developed over time and today we have what we call modern standard arabic and the the dialects across other arabic countries and of course classical arabic which is Everything that has to do with Arabic literature, religion, culture. Yeah. So, can you also like explain the new language that recently have been created after the progress of the social media, which is called Franco-Arabic? Yes, but I think before talking about Franco-Arabic, also it's important to mention 
about the dialects, I want to say that dialects are spoken in different Arabic countries. Like we have almost 27, I guess, or was it 28? 28 dialects that are different and every country has a different dialect. But what unifies the Arabic countries is the modern standard Arabic, which is the common language that unifies them. But the, the problem with this is that it's not the problem, but what makes it unnatural is that it, this is a language that the language, the modern standard Arabic language is never spoken. It's only the language you find in the newspapers and on formal or, or political talk shows. So for example, if I come to you and, and you're Egyptian and I'm Lebanese, right? You're Egyptian yeah. and I come and I speak to you in modern standard Arabic. Of course you will understand me, but what will you do the first thing you hear me? I'll laugh. <laughs> yeah, you will, you will laugh at me, of course. It's so weird. It's like I'm trying to speak Shakespeare's language in London. Of course, people might understand me, but they will definitely find me weird. That's yeah. what happens when you go to an Arabic country and you speak modern standard Arabic. But we still learn it. Everybody has to learn it because that's the, that's the language that unifies us. And um, that's the formal language. Yeah. Um, but when it comes to dialects, Dialects don't have a standardized written form and different people write them in different ways but, and different countries have their different dialects. But of course, uh, we do understand each other. Like, for example, if you speak to me in Egyptian, I don't have to reply in Egyptian. I reply in Lebanese, but there is this automatic adjustment that people do. And uh, uh, if I speak Lebanese, uh, somebody else replies in Egyptian and we don't even realize we're speaking two different dialects it feels so natural yeah it depends like if I'm if you're not saying a lot of Lebanese expressions that's not familiar for Egyptians I'm not going to understand it but yeah of course yeah, yeah of course yeah. so let's which, jump... which is what makes it unique yeah so let's jump to the Franco-Arabic question what is Franco-Arabic because there's a lot of people uh, that don't know anything about this language that we created as 19th generation for the social media to use the English letters to make so them sound like an Arabic words, which is really easy for not switching the keyboard from English to Arabic so we can write whatever we want in Arabic but with English letters. So actually we still using Arabic but using the English letter to speak Arabic, you know what I mean? Yes, that's how we do it. We use Roman letters, Latin letters, yeah. basically, um, to, to say stuff in Arabic. And sometimes it's even awkward in some Arabic countries and cultures. Like, for example, the culture I come from is very French-oriented. And if I type in Arabic, it's almost always in... Uh, it's, it's almost always by using Latin letters yes. uh, or, or, or the Roman alphabet, basically. But, um, and if I type in Arabic, it would sound a bit sometimes awkward. I, I won't say awkward, but it's, not awkward, it's just it's weird something we, we do. It's not something we do. And sometimes even, it, funny enough, we can even distinguish between uh, which area a person comes from or their background and all of that. Or By maybe the way, their age the as well. Their age. Like usually yes, our parents like writing yes. Arabic letters as well. Yes, yes. And that's how we can uh, distinguish yeah. between the cultural background of the person by the way they're writing, of course. Or even by the way they speak. Yeah. Yeah. So as we are like talking about the Arabic language we want to talk the, about the Arabic alphabet how many alphabet in the Arabic language and how do you teach them to the to your students there is something I need to uh, first of all uh, clarify when I say that when I'm speaking to my friends and I use the Roman alphabet it doesn't mean writing Arabic is not important not at all this is something very very important and I always use it with my students um, sometimes I have students who come to me and say oh, I just want to speak Arabic, but I don't want to Arabic, write Arabic. But in my opinion, it doesn't work this way. So first of all, to begin with, the Arabic alphabet has 28 letters. What makes it unique is that it doesn't st we don't write from left to right. We write from right to left. That's the first thing. The second thing is that in English, for example, you have 
letters in one form. You have the letter B that has one form, the letter C that has one form. But in Arabic, to make things more complicated, uh, every letter has four shapes. We have the letter... I thought there are three, one in the beginning, middle, and the end. Yeah, and when it's on on its own, when the letter is on its own. Yeah. Yeah. So when the letter is on its own, it has a shape. When it's at the beginning of the word, it has a shape. At the middle of the word, a different shape. And at the end of the word, another shape. But having said that, it's not too scary because it's not like you're learning a totally different letter. No, it's just little adjustments we make to the letter, like adding a tail in the beginning, a tail in the end, just to make it possible to, to to attach the letters to each other because Arabic is a cursive language. And also, of course, the printed form of the Arabic language when it's written, it's always different from when it's handwritten, uh, a little bit different. Like the shapes would be uh, less curvy when you're writing it. Mm, yeah. So this is the alphabet. But it's, in my opinion, why is it important to learn it? Even if somebody is not learning modern standard Arabic and they are learning a dialect, it's because it helps students in memorizing things. You, interna- you internalize things when you write them, right? It, yeah. makes you, it makes you become much, much more fluent. And of course, in the future, uh, when they want to buy books or read books, language books, I mean, uh, they should know how to read and write because they wouldn't be able to find resources if they rely on non-Arabic alphabet all yeah. their life. They can't rely on it all their life. So yeah. can we mention those 28 letters really quickly? Yalla, you will mention it with okay, me. Start. Alif. Ba. Ta. Fa. Gim. Ah, gim? <laughs> In Lebanese, we would say gim. Gim, you see? That's one of the differences. Egyptian, e- e- Egyptians go gim and I would go gim. Okay. And another Arabic person goes gim. So, yeah. yeah, I will say Jim because it's my language. <laughs> That's how I say it. Okay. Jim. Okay. Go. Ha. 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 Uh, be, I, I have to say it from the beginning. Alif, B, T, C, G, Ha. 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 Da. 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 Ra. Ra. Sin, Sheen. Go, Sheen, Sad, Dad, Dad, Ta, Ta, Za. And when I say Za, za. some people make fun of this because they go like Za, oh, Za. We don't za. do this in Lebanese, okay? We just go Za, okay? okay. Ain, Rain, Fa, Qaf, Kaf, Lam, Mim, Mim. Noon, hey, <laughs> wow, yay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, speaking of this, I just remembered something very important I do in terms of pronunciation. Um, when, we, when I'm doing the first, very, very, very first lesson with my students, before saying anything, before introducing ourselves, before talking, I introduce the difficult sounds in Arabic. And when I say difficult sounds, these are the sounds that don't exist in other languages. Like the sound, yeah. Ha. Ha. So when you say sabah al khair, it's really exactly. hard for my friends to sabah al khair. Exactly. English speakers have a tendency to pronounce it as a kh. Why? Because you know, if you don't try something, I don't know. If you've never danced in your life and you try to dance, you go to a dance class. Do you immediately feel, oh yeah, I'm capable of dancing, or you need some time, some practice, some training? And the same applies to speaking because it's, it's something that your throat is doing. It's a biological thing you've never tried in your life. So, of course, so it's not impossible to, to pronounce those difficult letters, right? No, of course not. And I'm not being pretentious here and using the word challenging instead of difficult. No, we have to be honest and say it's difficult for some people. And, and uh, they Much can get there, of people, course, yes. if they practice. Yeah, for some people, it depends on the language that you speak. It depends on your own native language, if you speak other languages as well. So, so can you mention um, some of those letters that have difficulty in how to say them? Yes, of course. So I always start with the letter ha, ha. Okay, ha. When, people, when people go ha, no. You have to say to them, it's ha. 
ha, it's like you when you clean your glasses you don't go like ha, ha, your eyeglasses no you really push the air out right you go like ha. yeah that's because in english they only have the letter h they don't don't they don't have the ha they have the he like exactly but that's different we have the letter ha in arabic in arabic yeah. but we also have the letter ha. ha so that's like really pushing the air out ha so we ha. try I try to introduce the ha sound and then I try to put vowels with it like ha, yeah. ho, hey. So we practice this a lot, a lot, a lot. And then we try to put them into words gradually. The next, word, the next letter would be, for example, the, and, I try to, and I try to, of course, create visual things that they can imagine doing so that they can remember the sound. So for example, when we're doing the ha, I always tell them, imagine, yourself see yourself as if you are cleaning your glasses when we go to the letter kha, for example kha, kha, i tell them imagine you're spitting that sound yeah so these are what things that what about the make... ra, which is in your name the... yeah that's really one of the most difficult ones but if you're french for example the ra should really be very easy for you because there are The R in the French language is mm-hmm. like the rain in our language, which is the same sound. R, r. So if you want to learn the letter rain, you can put a little bit of water in your mouth and you can go like r when you gargle. When you have a sore throat, you put lemon and water and whatever, salt in, in a cup and you go and you gargle, right? Yeah. So gargling really helps because it activates that part of the throat that pronounced the, pronounces the letter r. So I guess this is like the that. most important letter to the, your student should learn so they can say your name Pronounce right. my name. Yeah, of course. I, until now, I have people who call me Shaghik, Chaghik, Shahi. Oh, my God. But if you put a little bit of saliva in your throat, in the back of your throat, and you go like... Uh, uh, and that's how you can start pronouncing it. And of course, I always tell my students that, okay, you might have a sore throat today at the end of the lesson, but... Well, it's stuff that we should address from the beginning because, you know, you can you can learn grammar and maybe you can learn wrong rules or whatever, and then you can fix them. But once you pick up bad habits and pronunciation, that's really very, very difficult to reverse. Yeah. So it's very, very important to it's work on to your pronunciation. It's going to stuck in your head from the beginning. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you have to work on your pronunciation very, very well from the beginning. So that's the letters ha. We have the letter Ain, that one, oh my God. Like, yeah, really, like a Omar. lot of people, like, uh, like for example, here in the UK, uh, when it's Eid, they call it Eid. Eid. And I had a friend whose name is Omar, and he calls himself Umar. And I was Umar. trying to teach, and I was trying to teach him to say Omar. He wasn't able to say it. And I told him, you can't even pronounce your own name. But of course, it's not like he can't pronounce his own name, but that's how it's, it's said in English. So some in- proper nouns, yeah. even if they are Arabic in an English speaking country, they become different. It becomes Umar in that case. But this one is like, Arr. maybe you can imagine yourself like an angry dog and go like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love the acting then, techniques you have. <laughs> yeah. So, for example, in Arabic, a dog doesn't go woof, woof. A yeah. dog goes, ow, ow. So, oh, wow, wow. A- a- Arabic dogs have a different language <laughs> than British dogs. Yeah. Yes. Okay. You can say that. So, as we're speaking okay. about your students, which type of Arabic language do they ask you to uh, teach them? Like... The classical one, or uh, I guess that sometimes they ask you to have the Arabic integrated approach learning yeah. as well. That's a very important question. First of all, let's begin by explaining what is the integrated approach. It's more like a mixture of both modern standard Arabic, the language you find in uh, uh, newspapers, formal talk shows, as I said, and then you have the, the dialect, the spoken dialects, the different spoken dialects. So sometimes this approach is about teaching both at the same time, even if it's not to the same degree, but they start slowly introducing one. For example, if you're learning Lebanese Arabic, let's say, there is this approach, and with this approach, you start gradually introducing some words in modern standard Arabic so that mm-hmm. you don't really look at the two as separate languages. You look at them as one language. 
okay? So this is one approach. Uh, another thing is that I have students who want to learn modern standard Arabic. So before you start learning Arabic, it's very important to ask yourself, why are you learning Arabic? Okay? If you're learning Arabic because you want to travel to an Arabic speaking country, or you need Arabic for you, because you're, you, yes, you need Arabic because you're traveling to an Arabic speaking country and you're going to work in an Arabic speaking country and you will use Arabic in a formal capacity. Maybe you will write reports, emails in Arabic, you have to write Arabic articles, um, you want to understand the religion as well if you. If, you, uh, if you're a Muslim and you want to learn your own religion, of course, you have From to learn modern Quran. standard. Yes. And um, sometimes I also tell my students they, they can learn modern standard Arabic if they're going to teach Arabic. For, like if they want to learn Arabic linguistics, they have mm -hmm. to learn modern standard Arabic. But on the other hand, if you are someone who wants to learn Arabic to connect with people, uh, on a daily basis in real life and you want to get to the hearts of people to their emotions you use their dialect if you speak modern standard arabic it's going to sound very weird and you won't be able to to connect with those people on, a, on an emotional level so of course if you for example have a girlfriend you want to speak to her or a boyfriend you want to speak to her in her own language yes yeah. Of course, you have to speak a dialect. Uh, if, for example, uh, you want to talk to the people in the street, you want to go to the market, you want to buy fruits, you just want to go to the butchers, you have to speak the dialect. Yeah. Now, when it comes to the integrated approach, it really depends on the preference of the learner. There are learners who like that. There are learners who don't like that. Personally, I know a lot of... Uh, um, linguists don't like this but personally I like to separate things when it comes to learning the dialect when it comes to learning modern standard Arabic yes I like to integrate some dialect but when it comes to learning the dialect I like to really teach my own dialect as it is why first because I'm emotionally attached to it of course okay? because I like people to speak you know, like how people, humans speak on a daily basis. And also because I think that, as I said, sometimes when you try to mix both, it feels like you are, I don't know, like you are trying to speak a language that is not spoken. And it's like you, it, it sounds a bit patronizing as well, you know? Yeah. Um, or it sounds like you're an Arabic learner, so, but it's not going to sound 100% natural. That's my real opinion. And I don't know. For you as a teacher, which Arabic language do you prefer to teach people like which one you get excited? i like teaching both i love i love teaching modern standard arabic i really do and i love teaching lebanese of course because it yeah. has its own you know place yeah, I know in you're... my heart <laughs> yeah and i know that a lot of people appreciate it because yes there are lots of people who teach modern standard arabic but those who's, who teach lebanese arabic or the levantine dialect are very few so mm -hmm. i want to really talk about a myth the myth that the arabic language is difficult it really is not a difficult language at all it's a it's a very logical language with, with a very logical structure but the difficulty of the arabic is in its varieties and that's why people find it difficult not because when you focus on one of them on a dialect or msa or or it, it's not difficult but the difficulty of it is that you have to be patient it takes time you are not going to suddenly start speaking it oh yeah in four months yeah. or five and how months. much time really person, really be fluent how much time a person would need to be in a good level in arabic like it, also the, the word good level it needs a lot of definition it first of all it it depends on how many hours the person is studying a day how many hours of lessons they are taking how much homework do they do uh, what is their background, what language they speak, and their, their, per, like their learning abilities. Some people can be faster in speaking, but others can be faster in vocabulary. So it really depends on the, on the learner's uh, learning experience. But from my experience, I feel that like it, when I taught, okay, if I talk about the diplomats, diplomats that I was working with, they were doing three hours of Arabic every day mm -hmm. and five days a week. So that's like 15 hours of Arabic and let's say two, three hours of self-study. 
And within six months, they were capable of really having decent conversations of going to the shops, going to a restaurant, um, ordering food, uh, you know, those little basic conversations in life. But within one year, they were achieving very decent levels. I would say within two years, they would be very, very good. Yeah, um, I guess another that's by learning Arabic every day. But it, for those people who are studying, let's say, with me once or twice a week, it takes longer, but again, when I leave them with a lot of homework, they can really achieve yeah, very good levels practice. within six months or one year. I'm not saying they can speak anything with anyone, no, but some topics at least, they can discuss them, yes. And, and also another factor that affects that your students, if they are shy, if they're lazy, if they don't like to yes. do any mistakes, it also of like course. slow up this process of learning Arabic. Of course. So what advice do you give to people that always criticize people who don't speak the language? Like if they did any small mistake, they would say, oh, you, this is wrong. This is wrong. They give. You mean they self-criticize themselves or people who criticize others? Both. Okay. If it's people who criticize others, we don't care about them. We leave them to the side and we ignore them. But self-criticism... Do you get criticized in... as well? You as a teacher? Um... Mm. I might have been without my knowledge, but I've never, n never, never from my students, but I did get some, for example, once, once I got a comment on YouTube saying, oh, you're teaching this, it's not real Arabic, you're teaching uh, the Lebanese Arabic, or, uh, for example, I don't know, you're saying, um, okay, well, that's a lot of details, but in standard Arabic, we have what we call the the harakat, where we have to add v short vowel sounds at the end and the words like o, a, e. And sometimes we drop them, which makes the language a little bit less formal. So some, for some people, they feel like, oh, if we're not giving that information, it's like you're not giving the real Arabic. And, and when it comes to this, I think that's a bit ridiculous because the purpose of teaching a language and learning a language is being able to communicate. And when you communicate that you achieved your goal it doesn't matter if you make mistakes or whatever so really just go out there speak the language have you faith don't have in to be yourself, perfect trust yourself like, like for us live, living in london doesn't mean that we have to speak native british accent just speak the way that you of course you and even british people appreciate the fact that you can speak english anyway um, but having said that of course as a teacher i try my best to correct my students all the time whenever they make mistakes so that they can you know improve their language as much as they can because even like when we talk about mistakes there are common mistakes that become really like correct words you see what i mean like for example uh, I can't think of a word now, but there are things like that. Uh, and language is never a fixed entity. Language always changes and evolves. And we can't look at it as if it's like, okay, what one thing that is never going to change. That's why languages change a lot. Yeah. Can we show uh, people like a basic conversation in Arabic? So on this podcast, so you can learn a little bit of uh, words in Arabic. Me and Okay, you. of course. Are we going to do it the Lebanese Egyptian way or the standard Arabic way? Uh, Let's do it the Lebanese Egyptians for people. I don't. I don't speak Lebanese, but I will. No, try. you do the. You do I will the do the Egyptian, Egyptian and one. I do, yeah, and I reply okay. in Lebanese. Okay, let's go. Go ahead. I'm gonna start with Sabah al Khair. Bonjour. That's not um, Lebanese, by the way. Yeah, that's yeah, French. But that's this, how this we say French. it. Bonjour. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm Oh, you sound so French. This is not. This is not even. But but that's why that's the thing. The there is a very common expression we use when we are uh, talking about Lebanese people. The first thing they say is the first three words they say is hi kifak sava. Hi is in English. Kifak is in Arabic, and sava is in French. It's a way to show. It's actually a sentence that shows a question how that shows languages? how how multilingual Lebanese people are and how much we mix things. Yes. Yeah. It it's happens the same that, for Arabic. We always yes. use a mix of Arabic and English at the same time. Okay. So okay. So when the Yusuf? Kwayis. Winti. Alhamdulillah, Nia. Okay, fair enough. I guess that's enough because more than this, okay. people wouldn't understand anything. <laughs> so, okay. So we that, were just saying, what I've been how are you? And teaching my friends um, here in London. So this is what they know, actually. But let's let's just show them, for example, one example of the difference between the way we say, how are you? How do we say, how are you in Egyptian? 
um, okay, well, there's a feminine one, which is Amla A. If a masculine one is going to be. Or Izayak or Izayi. Or Izayik for uh, feminine or Izayak uh, masculine. So, for example, if Yusuf says Izayak, I say Kifak. You see, these are two completely different words. Yeah. And they both mean, how are you? Izayak, Kifak. So, yeah, they can be very different sometimes. But um, the Egyptian dialect is very, very commonly understood in most Arabic countries. Yeah, I was so about to say that. <laughs> yeah, because of the yeah. TV series and movies, we also understand. Uh, yes, Arabic. way before the internet, because of in the 60s especially, um, the, the, Egypt was the hub of, of Ar the Arabic cinema. And, uh, and all artists and singers and all those famous people, they were... Uh, hatching if i can say in in egypt so that's why uh, the egyptian dialect became very popular in arabic countries and most of us understand it because until today we still watch black and white, white movies in egyptian we hear egyptian songs recently however the the levantine dialect the lebanese dialect the syrian dialect also became very popular because of some foreign talk uh, talk shows and soap operas that were translated into our dialect and um, and also watched by other Arabic countries and also there are so many Lebanese singers that are very famous yeah. in Arabic countries and also of course the political situation in Syria and Lebanon that you know makes things yeah, uh, I got yeah. What you mean. gives more exposure to so if you want to learn a dialect you have to learn either Egyptian it's or Lebanese. Lebanese, yeah. Yeah, we're being so selfish right no, now. No, <laughs> but, but really, if you want to learn a, a dialect, so sometimes people ask me, which dialect should you learn? I yeah. give them two options. One, first of all, uh, who do you want to communicate with? Where is the, the person you want to communicate with or the people you want to communicate with from? Uh, are your, uh, what origin are you? Choose that one. So, for example, if your girlfriend is from... Uh, from, from Tunis. You know... From Tunis, Algeria, yeah, you can France. yeah you can learn the Tunisian dialect. Of course, that would be much better for you. But if you don't have anyone, like and you don't have anyone specific, you have to choose a dialect that is very widely spoken. And yes, two of the widely spoken dialects are the Egyptian, the Levantine and dialect, and the Egyptian. And now it's time for Q and A. Shariq, now I'm going to ask you four questions. If you didn't answer them really quickly and correctly, then you, ha you have to do something I'm going to ask you for, okay? Deal? Okay. Deal. Okay. First question is, mention five English loan words that are originally Arabic. So guys, loan words is words that are originally from another con uh, language like French, German, Spanish that we use in English, but they're originally... I don't know coffee maybe which one the which one comes for it came first coffee or ahwe Okay coffee I'm is, not is, sure. is, 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 is it's correct keep going Okay uh zafaran saffron Okay um what else do we have sugar sukkar I'm not sure which one came first they I are similar so, no. <laughs> Okay um what else do we have mm, I can't remember now Then you lost Okay. Okay, admit it. Okay, you have coffee, alcohol, cotton, which is... Ah, cotton. alcohol, cotton, cotton, yes. Cotton alcohol is, is cotton. 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 Alcohol. Laymoon, okay. which is lemon. Lemon. Oh, okay. And algebra, which is algebra. You fail for mm. the second It's question. funny how I was teaching this and <laughs> I forgot it. Yeah, okay. Okay, mention... This is the second question. Mention 13 countries where Arabic language is the main language at them. Okay, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, Palestine, Egypt, Iraq, uh, Yemen, uh, the, UAE, the UAE, Okay. Uh, okay. Tunis, 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 Maghrib, Jazeir, okay. Algeria. Uh, what else? Um, only one left that you can be th more than 13 so more than one <laughs> uh, uh, Oman okay uh, right yeah. Yemen okay Yemen I said it did you say Libya I didn't say Kuwait. Libya Kuwait I didn't and yeah. I guess Somalia as well okay 
Yes. And I guess in the United States of America as well, it's one of the main languages. Okay. Yeah, By so the way, did you know that Arabic is the second most learned language in the UK after English? Oh, this, this is a good information to share. I didn't know that. I think, I think, I, I think so. I'm not 100%, but maybe 99% sure. Okay, let's jump to the third question. And I hope you are prepared for it. So, as we talked in the beginning that Arabic language is very unique. And uh, one of the things that makes it unique that we don't have capital letters. So... Oh yeah, I should have told you that before. Yeah, I know this. So, the question is... And it's, instead of the capital letters, what do we use in writing to emphasize or stress on any words? You know, when we use capital letters to stress on something when we're talking and we're writing? Ah, you mean, oh, I think the way we do it is by repeating a letter many times, or that's how I do it at least. Okay, and anyways, we yeah, don't, I, I we can, do I can, I can, I can say that this is right. Or maybe we use more exclamation marks, but uh, yeah, it's quotation can, marks. Yeah, quotation marks? I yeah. never saw someone do it. I do it. <laughs> okay, but it's easier to, to just use ex exclamation marks. It's just faster than opening a quotation mark and then putting the word and then closing. Okay, it's still a mm. wrong answer, so you're doing... No, but I think the best answer would be when you repeat a letter a lot, like, uh, yeah. like three or four times. Or just send a voice note shouting. <laughs> yeah, that's the best, of course. Okay, last question. Give me more than five words that express the word love. Habib, habbak, ta'jibni, mood, fik, yo. Okay, but. <laughs> you see, you see I'm, not... I'm, I'm much faster okay. when it comes to love expressions than counting countries. <laughs> yeah, but countries. the last one that you said, I should like uh, cut it from the editor. No, don't cut it. Like I said, yo, burn it. Oh my god, don't we use again. <laughs> This is an expression we use a lot in Lebanon and we actually yeah, we say use... it to kids, we use it to babies. When I say to a baby, you okay, okay. Like, we, we, I'm literally you saying, have to explain this. Let's may, <laughs> may your bum, uh, okay, whatever. Okay. So, may your bum we're not gonna bury talk about me, I love you so gonna... much. Okay, she's just, oh. <laughs> that's how we say it, I love you so much that I want to okay, die okay, before that's, you. Okay, okay, okay. I'm going to jump really quickly to the other part of the questions for you, Shariq. So, jumping on your professional working experience, uh, how many people that you have told so far? Like, give me a range of numbers. Oh my God, I, so much. I don't know. I didn't even think about it. If I've been teaching like, Arabic number, for like, like seven years in the UK, eight years almost in the UK. So, that's a, like a big number. I don't know. You don't know? But like, if, if you're going to say a number like 150? 300. 300. I'm just like, I throw a number, let's say on average, if it's, wow. oh, it's not 300, it's, it's much less than the, uh, 250, yes, 200, I don't know. 200, okay, let's say it's 200. Yeah. So for people being in quarantine right now, and how can you advise them if they want to learn a new language? And well, if they're, of course, if they're not Arabic. working, if they're not working, it's a great opportunity for them to learn a language because because a lot of the things that we have now on, are online and for free. So if you go to my channel, for example, you will find, I don't are know, around 150 videos for yeah. free. I don't remember, 130 something. I don't know. That's a lot of content. And I put a lot of long lessons. Yeah, too. we're going to come to that. But I'm asking in general, if anyone wants to learn a new language, what advice? Make, make, make the most of the free information world that we live in. And then, uh, of course, buy yourself some books. If you want to learn things during the quarantine, you can buy online books. But there are so many apps people can use, but mainly, 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 you have to have the willpower to do it and you have to be organized. Uh, but yeah, you, people can okay, try. And how can people... I know many people who were self-teaching themselves and it works for a while, but then you will need a teacher. Yeah, of course, you always need a teacher and sometimes you need to travel to a country and of course. Like, surround yourself with people speaking this language. That Yes, you're... and that's what I do with my videos because I know that a lot of people don't have the chance to to integrate themselves in, a, in an Arabic speaking country. So I create vlogs and I create authentic videos that kind of gives learners the experience of 
you know, being in an Arabic country. Okay, good that you mentioned that. So for people who are willing to learn Arabic right now and they're listening to this podcast, how they can reach your channel or reach you in person if they need uh, a course or anything? Well, my channel is called Globetrot with Arabic because I initially created it to teach Arabic online to those people who need flexible learning hours. Maybe they like to travel and have adventures around the world. Maybe they are entrepreneurs or, I don't know, full-time mom and dad. Anyone who wants to learn Arabic without making excuses. So that's why I called it Globetrot with Arabic. So what was the question? How people can reach you? So, so they can reach me by going to my channel on YouTube, which is yeah. called Globetrot with Arabic. We can Arabic. put the link for the channel in the description or, or at yes. this episode. And, and you can also go to my Instagram and follow my page on Instagram, Globetrot with Arabic. I almost upload lessons uh, on a daily basis, uh, small lessons, big lessons. And now I'm, I'm on TikTok. Oh Yay! my God. Yeah. I've seen and a lot I'm, of videos. And I'm putting videos on TikTok. You can find me at Globetrot with Arabic. I have a SoundCloud and a LinkedIn account, Globetrot with Arabic. But if you want to reach me directly, of course, you can text me anywhere on those platforms. So the content... But I have my own email address, which is Sharik, C H A G H I G, at globetrotwitharabic.com. We're going to put all that in the, in the description below. But yeah. For the YouTube channel and Instagram, this is a free content, right? But if someone really wants a, like a proper course, they should DM you or send you an email, right? Yes, of course, because I already put so many free stuff out there. And when it comes to courses, I need to make a living, you know? So yeah. I can't give everything for free at some point. Yeah, yeah you need to give them like uh, assignments and check on them. And it takes a lot of my energy as well. And their energy yeah, of course. Is something Bless you. Thank so, you. So um, working on your content and you're saying it takes a lot of time and energy. What obstacles do you face in teaching Arabic or uploading your content on different social media platforms like SoundCloud, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok? The, uh, the obstacle, the main obstacle is that I work on my own and I do every single detail on my own. Uh, but I love this obstacle because I am a, I am a very hands-on person and I like doing things on my own and I don't always trust. And that's a problem I have. I do, I'm not a person who knows how to give things to others. But um, it's still an obstacle because things take much more time when you're doing it alone. And it's not as easy as it sounds initially. Like, you know, when people tell you, oh, you have to do this on YouTube, you have to upload it in this way. You have to know how to put the keywords, the title. You, and then you come, you try everything and you don't get views. You still don't get views. You know, you put hours and hours and hours of work into a video. Uh, and in the end, only a hundred people see it. And it, uh, it's really sometimes demotivating, you know, because it takes I know what you a mean, but it's, lot of time. Yeah, it, it always comes to that video that go viral and then everything else pops off. Well, so, I'm still waiting for it. it it's going to happen. happen. Trust me. So, but thank God I do have a lot of people who appreciate yeah. my work and it's growing. It's growing. No? How many followers uh, or subscribers you have so far? I think today I was checking it was 1,560 around something oh, like that's that. Good. I guess you, th this is that's on YouTube. Number. But on Instagram, I have around four and a half K, which is not wow. bad at all. That's really good. Yeah. And how long have yeah. you la launched your YouTube channel? Like for one year, I guess? Uh, yeah. I've been uploading uh, on, a, on a regular basis since one year, but I've had it for about a year and a half, but I work. Initially, yeah, I, I guess since I have moved videos. to London. <laughs> yes, a bit late, a bit later. On. So next month in May, it's going to be one year basically wow. where, that I upload regularly. Okay, for yeah. your course as well, l let us give uh, the, the students that are eager to have a course with you. What is mm -hmm. the teaching technique that you use in your teaching course? Yeah, it depends also if it's a, pers a personal course, a face-to-face -face private lesson or a, or group lessons. At the moment, I guess I'm at the moment you don't have group lessons. Do yeah. Two time. Yeah, at the moment I'm running group lessons because of the situation with COVID-19 and also group lessons are usually cheaper so people find it more uh, okay to do group lessons. Uh, the way I teach usually is very very conversational because you know at the end of the day that's why people are learning a language to have a conversation. So my way is very conversational. 
but at the same time so I include all aspects of language learning in my lessons whether it's grammar vocabulary listening speaking writing I do believe that listening is very very important but not just passive listening active listening when you listen and repeat listen repeat like a parrot because that's how you develop native like fluency and do you encourage them to watch like Arabic movies or listen to Arabic music as well of course yes and I use the Arabic movies in my classes I transcribe them we go over them it gives them a very good feeling that they're actually understanding something that is you know in different languages and, 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 yeah and, and in real life as well even if it's a movie but the real life situations basically even now i encourage my students to to uh, for example when they go to my tiktok i even got messages last week of of uh, one of the my instagram followers sending me a voice message and repeating one of the tongue twisters that i was doing on tiktok the idea is not just to listen oh yeah it's fun and have fun no Try to mimic as much as you can. Lip syncing is one of the most difficult things you can ever do. And if you do it when you're learning a language and you're trying to lip sync Arabic, oh my God, your native like fluency will improve really like at the speed of light. That's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> so um, is there anything before we end this podcast? Did I ask you everything? Do, there's any information you want to share with anyone listening to this podcast about you or about the Arabic language or about your course? Well, yes. If you want me to say about my course, it's a course starting next week on April 20. 2020, 2020, 20, so that's a very nice yeah, it's, it's a good. Day. I will be teaching three levels, the absolute beginners, a general course, and the advanced. The absolute beginners is for people who have never spoken Arabic or can't read and write. Uh, the general course is for those people who can read and write and have had some exposure to the Arabic language from six months to one year and a half. And then the advanced course for people who have studied Arabic for about two years. Um, you can leave, if you want, I can give you the information to leave in the link, uh, to, uh, the link to leave in the comment box you know, yeah. of the times of the lessons. I'm even opening a lesson from 12 a.m. to 2 a.m. London time. That's for the people who are in the USA. Okay, that's, that's really cool that you're trying to reach everyone <laughs> different yeah, countries. Yeah, I'm trying my best. Okay. Thank you, Sharik, so much for having you today in my Thank Big you. Juice podcast. And I Thank wish you. next time I'm going to see you face to face, not through an application. Yes, or anything. I wish to because it's tiring to be alone. Yeah, it is. But hopefully it's going to end very, very soon. And thank you so much, so much for today, Sharik. And thank I'll... you. Yeah, this is the first interview I've ever done in my life. So I'm feeling important. The same. <laughs> this is the first so the... interview theme. So podcast. thank you for making me feel so important. You are very important. Like I, I've learned a lot about my language having this podcast episode with you. So thank okay, you so thank much, Sharig. And you're I welcome. Wish you all the best and good luck in your course and for your students as well. Thank you. Bye. That's it, guys, for listening for Big Juice Podcast. I had so much fun with my guest today. I wish you all guys learned something new from this episode. And see you very, very soon in another episode. See you soon on Big Juice TV on YouTube channel. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.